Well, big friendly hellos. Welcome to the first notary or allocator governance call taking place on February 6th. This is a big call related to the allocator selection process. So the majority of the content that we're going to cover on this call is going to be related to that selection. So we're going to start off with an overview of what are the scoring process and how do those applications come in. We're going to deep dive and look at some of the metrics on what were the applications centered around, what were some averages and learnings that we saw in those applications. Then we'll show you the selections, where to go to see the scores and how to review them and how to understand it. Then we're going to walk you through a detailed update on like opt-ins. What are meta pathways? How can this benefit you and the program? Then we're going to talk about what are next steps for selection and take some time for any FAQ. There should be lots of time at the end of the call for any discussions that we want to have. And as always, if there's anything that comes to mind live, feel free to shoot a hand up in the chat and we'll call or just leave a comment and we'll get back to you as we go. So with that, as a friendly reminder, this call happens every two weeks. This is the first of February 6th. The next call will be at 1800. These are posted on YouTube, where if you're watching this, you already know that. We are going to be looking at the calendar coming forward. Any allocators right now have to follow this Google link to a shared calendar. After ratification and onboarding, we will manually add the email addresses for allocators just to make it a little bit easier for you to follow this meeting. But as always, you can go ahead and follow that shared link. And the reason, just as a note, why we do this only after elections is with the shared calendar, anytime we add or subtract an email address, it sends a ping. So feedback in the past was, I'm getting too many pings from this. It turns into spam. Purge it loud and clear. So now we batch do it, or you can follow that invite. And as a reminder, we'll be doing a poll after the allocator to make sure that this time works for folks. So we're on this morning call. There's a few of us. Is the mic call make more sense to focus our priorities? Is there content that you want to see? So any allocators, stand by, and we'll be getting your feedback on how to make this time the best for you as we go into it. So with that, let's take a look at the scoring and application process. So as a reminder, this opened up, and we had the open allocations for around eight weeks. And that time was designed to give plenty of time for a thoughtful production of what the application would be doing for the organizations. That closed on January 20th, and for the last two weeks, the governance team has been reviewing those applications. In that review, there were 97 that came through, which means we had to read those 97 applications line by line to see what was the plan that was selected for each organization, did it make sense within the programs, and then with those applications, have some kind of a rubric that we could score and compare those. And so this was the rubric that we shared back in November. So what the governance team has been doing is taking each line in those applications, reviewing it to this rubric, and identifying a score ranking based off everyone else and the own individual application to get a baseline score. And that's just what finished up Friday, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this call. So to start, I, before I announce the scores, I'd like to kind of highlight some findings from those metrics for everyone on the call to kind of get a sense of what are the organizations that are participating in this. So the first one I'd like to call out is there were three types of allocator models that an organization could select to. And what you see in this graph is the overwhelming majority of applications in this initial fifth round, 75% actually, selected for that manual option, very similar to how we had the LDN in the past where there was a human looking at the application, reviewing that, providing the diligence, and then moving it forward. We saw a dead split of 12.5% between the automatic and the market-based solutions. So this is kind of telling as far as like where the organizations are as far as their readiness to move forward into this market-based or automatic approach versus this allocator model with the manual base. So that'll play in a little bit more as we talk about opt-ins and groupings, and we'll get into that on the call. The second kind of finding to call out is where are the majority of allocators based geographically? So in the application, we ask for the region of operation, as well as like where you're going to be doing business. An organization may do, do, do business worldwide, but they might be based in one of these. The big findings were there's three main geographic areas that we're seeing the allocators based. That's China, Singapore, and the U.S., which account for 64% of all applications. And the other, you know, 36%, that comes from all over the world. The Netherlands, Africa, we saw a very wide distribution on it. But it's very clear that the majority of the times, the zones, it's coming from those two main areas, China, Singapore, as well as the U.S. As far as strategy, it was very telling to see in those applications, 
how were these applications and allocators approaching like how they were going to conduct the business? So one of the questions that we asked was like, hey, for your software based approach, how do you plan to do it? And as you can see from this graph breakdown, 71% of the allocators said, hey, we plan to use one of the either existing tooling or our own tooling to really move forward on this and conduct our reviews and our diligence. While 39% of the manual reviews said, hey, we're still going to look at this and have a human in the loop, on the loop, taking a look at this data, which also plays into some of the things that we'll talk about in this call for diligence, for checks and compliance. So it's important to note just where those allocators are looking and where their time will be invested. And the last metric to kind of call out is looking at the data cap requested. So if you can see from this chart, we have a huge spike around three numbers that seem to come up in the majority of applications. I think this accounted for over 60%. And that was 100 PIBs, 150, and 200 PIBs. So the majority of the applications are looking to distribute a very high number of PIBs going out and then making sure that those PIBs are going out in a strategic way. And if you see this line trail that we have, this could be anywhere from one PIB up to 3,000. And we'll talk about how those allocator data cap will be distributed and audited and compliance. But a big takeaway on this one is kind of the size that most allocators anticipate for their business models in 2024. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Galen, who's going to walk us through what the selection process was, how to view your scores, and everything associated with it. Galen, thanks. Thank you. Can you uh, click forward just once, please? Okay, I want to resolve something that's coming up in the chat um, for Julian. He's saying uh, that he's seeing uh, orange and yellow colors um, on like the Airtable link. And I'm just going to pause here before we jump into this. On um, mine, it should be blue and red, but I don't know if this is one of those like, what color is the dress, uh, like color acuity tests where I'm actually just insane. Um, Okay, Julian, we'll do we'll we'll share your screen at the end. Um, but do you see the same kind of at least like the checkbox and like the average score as it's highlighted over here? Okay, all right, we'll we'll troubleshoot that at the end. Then it could just be like a weird Airtable color settings. Um, <clears throat> okay, sorry, tangent. Um, so so we scored through everything as Kray said uh, and. You know, it's always hard with these things to to set a a cut line in advance um, because we want to see the pool of people that are applying, um, and we want to be able to see that pool and say these are people raising their hand saying they want to join this community and do work for this community. Let's try to bias towards yes. Let's try to bias towards trust and then verify. These are things that are outlined in in FIP three um, around scaling trust over time. So if somebody makes these qualitative claims about how they will behave as a notary allocator, if those things are safe enough to try and in line with program principles, let's try to bias towards yes and give them um, an extension of data cap as a allocator for them to give out to their clients. And let's see, did they meet you know, their own criteria? Um, if so, let's continue to scale that trust. If not, Let's have an intervention. So that's why the minimum score is set the way that it is. There were a group of you know, applications that either didn't really understand uh, what they were applying for, or maybe were missing some key, key uh, parts. Uh, there were some questions around, will you enforce local legal and regulatory requirements? And some, some applicants uh, said, did, did not say yes. Um, if you don't do that, it is very hard for us to authorize you um, to be onboarding data onto the network uh, if you will not hold legal requirement standards. Um, that's kind of a, a pretty uh, a hard line for the program. That is not what Filecoin exists uh, to do. There's still various gray areas about what exactly does that mean, but it, that is a determination that you as a fiduciary of this network need to be willing to say you will help to enforce and support. So we'll be able to uh, check that. Um, Carrie, can you click forward once, please? You'll see right there, um, there's a little meta pathway recommended. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. So we'll come back to that. Click forward again. Um, as we said, here's the Airtable link. We've dropped it in chat. There's a QR code for it. Um, it lists everyone on there. This is kind of like back in the, the good old days, uh, 
college where the professor just staples up everybody's score on the door and you're going to go find your name and see how you did. Um, it's pretty sanitized. Uh, these should be transparent. You know, we posted everyone's replies back to GitHub as well. You can go see what people put in their application um, and here are the scores. We'll work to push those scores directly back to each GitHub issue for um, transparency and long-term kind of accountability. Um, it was a higher priority right now just to publish all of the scores and, and let everybody know. Um, so we'll work as we go through the ratification process of the next week or so to publish those back to each GitHub issue the same way we published uh, you know, the content from their Airtable um, in the issue. Uh, click forward again, please. So here, we're going to remind you of, of a, a key component to this process around these compliance checks. So the way this is going to work, we're approving, um, I think it's something like approximately 80 of these allocator pathways. That's great, that's fantastic. That's a lot of teams that want to build um, and work to support data onboarding and bringing real data to Filecoin. We don't know if all of those teams are ready to do so. We don't know if all of those teams are able to meet their stated requirements. Will they enforce their rules with their clients? Uh, yes or no. The best way for us to suss that out is to trust and then verify. So an initial amount of data cap will be distributed to these different teams to verify that they can operate in their parameters. Qualitatively, if you said we will only work with clients that will do five plus replicas, if you begin giving out data cap to clients and those clients are not doing five plus replicas, you are responsible for intervening and not giving those clients additional data cap and making it clear that you caught that, intervened, and changed how you were treating that particular client, as well as maybe ways that you're asking questions or ways that you're um, vetting these clients to begin with. The burden is on the allocator to be intervening with your downstream clients. If you are working with clients and you say they need to be using certain types of storage providers with a certain level of retrievability, if your clients are not meeting your standards, the onus is on you, the burden of proof is on you, we, the governance team, will perform these compliance checks to see if you are holding your clients to your own standard. If you are, then we will make requests to the root key holders to top up the amount of data cap that you have. We're working on figuring out how to make that as fast and efficient and smooth as possible so there won't be a decrease or an interruption in service. But these compliance checks, at least initially, are going to have manual components. We will be looking at all of your allocations down to your clients and how those clients are behaving in their deal making on chain. You are this leverage focal point. The compliance team will look at your work as it relates to the your clients and their storage providers. If it's not in compliance, you will not receive additional data cap. You'll need to show that you're making changes. You could reapply in the future. Um, if it is in compliance, we will top up that amount of data cap. We'll request the root key holders to top up. We're working on what that looks like. Some of the things that have been suggested is that we double that amount. So every team will start with five. And there is a possibility that we will then, for the compliant teams that are clearly and highly compliant, we will run an audit, ideally, before they run out, when they have one PIB remaining, um, but we could start doing those checks faster and sooner. If everything is looking good, your clients are behaving correctly, you are behaving correctly, the SPs they are working with are behaving correctly, meeting all of your parameters, then what we might do is double that to 10 PIBs, double it, double it, so that we can build capacity and runway for these allocators. Um, so stay tuned on that. Those things will be public um, as to like how they're functioning. Um, but it's gonna, we're gonna come back around to it. Let's do some frequently asked questions. Uh, if you did not get selected, apply again. Look at the other applications, look at where you think maybe you were missing some things, what could you do differently? But again, do not over promise and under deliver. That is going to be a worse mark against you in the future. If you say, 
yes, I will only work with clients that are, you know, doing 10 copies across 50 SPs. That might be very hard for you to find those clients and hold those clients to that standard. So set standards that you can uphold, um, but apply again in the future. Um, when will they receive their initial distribution of five PIBs? Our target goal is for the end of February. We've got 23 days. It's a leap year, so we get to cheat a little bit. Um, but our targeting that at Phil Dev Summit, we'll be working to have completed the onboarding process and be um, uh, making those requests of the root key holders to distribute the five PIBs. That will be the same time that the LDN will be sunset. So as the root key holders check all of this governance work and start sending those messages to provide new data cap to new addresses, they will also be removing data cap from all previous addresses. Um, the LDN multi-sig, um, all previously approved uh, direct notaries, um, other, the, the enterprise proof of concept, all of those will have their data cap um, removed just for cleaner compliance checks going forward. And will the application receive the total amount requested? K Ray had on the slide over there where that, that chart was. We ask people to anticipate their usage for a year. Part of that is how well are you thinking about this pathway? How well are you doing your projection mapping? How much you know have you invested in building a client funnel? Um, are you just guessing and pulling numbers or are you does the number that you have seem in line and what we can then do is say well how quickly did you start onboarding people does that look accurate does your does the total amount you requested for 12 months um seem to be accurate this helps the governance team as well as other you know teams in the ecosystem anticipate demand um, for data cap and what that might look like across a 12 month time scale but that does not mean that you are going to get the amount that you requested on that question. Um, so if you went in there and said, we need you know, 3,000 PIBs in a year, we, we, the governance team, are not going to request that the root key holders send one address 3,000 PIBs at once. It's just not the structure of you know, scaling this trust. So all the teams are going to receive five to start. We're going to do the compliance checks and build from there. Um, next slide, please. highest possible score um i'd have to i think it i think it was across i think like you could get a five on every question theoretically um and there were something like 30 some odd questions that were scored i think um so something like that but um i think the highest scores that we saw were like in the 150 to 170 range um okay so uh, in reviewing a lot of these um, applications, a lot of people said they would do manual checks. They would be working with very similar types of clients. They'd be working with similar types of data and that they would use similar tooling. And that's reasonable. We have a lot of people that have been in this ecosystem working as LDN notaries that reapplied. Um, we have people that have been in this ecosystem working before the LDN that applied. And their application looked uh, pretty similar to the current status quo of the LDN process. So we are going to kind of look back at where we where we started with this when we were proposing these meta pathways and work to have this this recommendation. So Carrie, if you could click forward one, please. So here's what we're doing. Um, this is a recommendation. This is not going to be a requirement, but I think that it is going to be the most um, streamlined, efficient, and satisfactory process um, for the teams. We, based on some of the questions in like the 30 range, I think it's like 34, 5, 37, we ask questions around what tooling will you use to construct your messages on chain? What tooling will you use for all these other things? Will you use open source tooling um, from the Falcon Plus governance team. Uh, for people that said yes, for people that it seemed like this is they're they're operating this in this band, whether they are working with enterprise encrypted clients or public open clients, um, we made a a best guess pass of recommending that 
you should join this meta pathway group. Um, we'll probably set these up as you know maybe two separate meta pathways one that's tailored to open uh, public open retrievable data and one that's tailored to private and encrypted data um, we're figuring that out the back end structures we still gotta iron out the kinks but the gist of it is if you are you know joining this ecosystem and saying that this is how you want to function as an allocator you want clients to be able to apply to you on some public facing form you want that application to show up in a ux ui for you to do the compliance and action it you want to be able to use tooling that we're building to construct that message and send it on chain and you want it to manage all of that downstream integration with the back end audits compliance checks the bookkeeping the best way for us to do this and plug everybody into that tooling in a nice efficient end-to-end system is to use some similar processes. So rather than everybody creating their own special fork of all the different tools and hosting their own instance of every tool that's being built, that's going to lead to a lot more management by the governance team, a lot more work by the dev teams to keep those people up to date, and just a lot more opportunities for things to not integrate correctly. And where this can become a problem for you is you, as an allocator, may miss clients that are applying. You may miss updates to tooling by not you know, being connected to when updates ship. And a big one is it's going to make the, those compliance checks harder and slower. So if you start giving out your data cap and you're running out of it and it is time for the governance team to do a compliance check audit and you're using a totally separate set of tools and a totally separate set of infrastructure, running that compliance check is going to be a much harder manual process for us to say, Show us your bookkeeping. Um, show us where you know the accounting for every allocation that you made. Show us each of those clients like downstream interactions. We're building the tooling to capture as much of that as possible based on scraping the chain, which is stuff that we've been doing with the datacapstats.io. That will continue to exist. But there's a lot of other ancillary KYC and compliance diligence information um, that goes on that isn't captured on chain. And so getting all of that into a consistent space will help make those compliance checks faster. It will make those compliance turnarounds faster. It will make the top-ups from the root key holders faster. It will decrease potential interruptions in service. So the goal is to design this tooling so that if uh, these teams opt in to this meta pathway, we'll be shipping, it'll probably look like one repo. It'll probably look like one front end. And then we will work on various settings and customization because there are differences in these applications. For example, you know, some of these people uh, said they would work with people that are doing two plus replicas and some said five, but those can be different settings that we tweak inside the customization. We don't need to fork everything in order to have that much um, discretion. So stay tuned on this. Um, <clears throat> that's what that check mark means. Some of the ones that didn't receive that check mark, it's because they are proposing a system where they're building their own custom tooling. And it doesn't necessarily make sense to group them into this existing um, suite with the, the registry. For example, we have some people that are actually designing and building automated mechanisms that have a more robust kind of uh, storage provider selection process, right? There's something else that is happening behind the scenes. This is what we wanted in moving in this direction with the application cycle. We want more teams that are designing more of these types of pathways. So we're excited to see those teams that didn't get this check mark. I don't want this to feel like it's it somehow means that that's like punitive or lower trust or that we um, don't think those teams are going to be successful. These are just teams that are designing something where it doesn't necessarily make sense from us reading the application to group them together with, for example, the open data set pathway or the enterprise pathway. Um, so we'll, uh, I see a couple of messages. Um, Ruby has a question about, I'm going to take these like questions and then we'll move. Um, has this push to a monoculture single choke point help with decentralization? Uh, I would say that this is not a push to a monoculture. I would say that we are pushing 
more of these teams that applied and said, I want to run a pathway. What we are doing is we're saying, here is the tooling infrastructure to do so. You're going to join one repo. You're still the owner of you know, the manager in that repo. Um, it just makes it more efficient for us to run the tooling. But it is not saying that that is where all the deterministics have to come from. It's really just around making the tooling uh, cleaner. I would love to get to the point where we can break that tooling out you know, faster and be able to say, okay, we can take this piece and it is now a, a package. And that, for example, the retrieval bot can be a you know very easy, fully separate package that people can go plug into. And we don't need to do as much of that handholding to set up the repos the same way um, because people are more experienced with you know how they'll run their APIs. I would like to get to that world based on reading the applications. I think that a lot of people want a they want the tooling to be solved for them. Um, so I don't think that this is a a, a single choke point around that. I also think that it is similar to some of the realities that we've had existing already with the notary registry as it functions where notaries sign in, they connect with their GitHub, they see open applications, they can action them. We want to level all that up so that it is more tailored to these different allocator pathways, um, but it is a incremental step. And in addition, because we are pushing for more of these other teams that are designing it, and this is just a recommendation. So if teams want to say, no, I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to join this meta pathway grouping, I want to you know, fully fork and run host everything myself, teams will be able to choose to do that. I'm, I'm just cautioning that it may make some of those compliance checks more difficult. Um, will, I think, had a reply to that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore Will because, you know, he's replied to everything. Faye, had a question, meta recommendation uh, means using PL tools or the other way around. I, yeah, hopefully that just clarified it. So again, um, it's it's tooling that is being paid for by the Filecoin Foundation as well as PL um, that we are you know working to open source and package as cleanly as possible. But in the meantime, I think it's just going to need to be a more of an iterative step up. Pausing there, let's see if there are any hands on this topic before we move forwards. Okay, I don't see any, um, so we'll jump to the next slide, which I think is about onboarding. Um, great, K raises is you or me? Sorry, I couldn't remember. Yeah, I'm all set. So congratulations, allocators selected. Looking forward to great things together. So we talked about this on the last call, so a little bit of a refresher, but now that it's real, let's dive into it. So the first thing that we're going to have to do is the ratification and onboarding process. And what this means is the basic KYC and diligence checks. So in the application, we ask for your full legal name, your email. And I've started to send out emails from the address philplusphill.org saying, hey, we received this application. I'm verifying your email address. This does two things. Some email addresses are specific to the organization. Like, hey, here's my organization. Here's my organization email. Some emails might be just like user123 at Gmail. So what we're doing is we're verifying those email addresses and then checking them against the organizations and the data. So if you haven't gotten that email, stand by. You'll probably be receiving it this week. Those of you that have verified, thank you for that step. Why this is important is we take all of that contact information and we use it for a very detailed sanctions check. This is required for any distribution working. And what this means is that we have to have a human's name and the origin of their location where they're operating by. And this goes through a review audit. So this means that if an application comes through and it was selected, but we don't have a response to the email address and we don't have a proper verification of a human, it means we cannot move forward with ratification and onboarding. Now, this is really important. You see a red date at the bottom of the slide, and that's 29 February. The reason why we're giving such a long period of time is those of you that fall in the three main categories realize there is a major holiday coming up that should last until I think the 24th. So we wanted to give ample time for those of you that might be on break to still take that break and still file this in. 
But the deadline to have all of this completed is the 29th, which means that any allocator that was selected that doesn't complete the verification, doesn't provide the information needed, will have to be iceboxed and move your application back. And in Q2, when we set up the automation process to do this without the election, then you could resubmit it. But this is very important, and I want to stress that any new allocator selected, please ensure that if you're getting that email from philplus.org, that you're writing back and that we have a human and we have all the contact information needed. Once we've got that done, we'll be doing an official onboarding. For any notaries from the fourth round, you may remember this. What we do is we talk a lot about what are the toolings. So as we highlighted on the call, I think it was 60% of the applications were selecting the manual option. So what tools exist? There's been a lot of updates to the tooling in the last Q2, Q3, Q4. So making sure that you understand how to use those, how to take a look at like, what does good diligence look like? What does good bookkeeping look like? And what does an audit look like? What will the CID checker do? So we'll spend a lot of time going through these process. And the goal is that you fully understand the expectations of serving as an allocator, that you're fully set up with your ledger, you understand how that whole process works, and there's no surprises if it should come back in the future. This is meant to answer any questions. We'll set these up as calls, recordings, and then guides, and then ideally we'll have these translated based off needs. And again, the purpose of the onboarding is to set you, the allocator, up for success as you start your process moving forward. So with that, Galen, I'll turn it back to you for any final thoughts or open it up for discussion. Yeah, opening up the floor. Uh-oh, I see a someone from the deep state is here. We got trouble. Good to see you again, Deep. Hope things are well. Reba, you got a hand up. What you got? Yeah, I uh, have a question that I actually wants to put on the record. So uh, I filed an application that was scored in like the bottom 10 of uh, all existing. Um, is there going to be a public reasoning for, you know, where it fell through in the rubric? Uh, are you saying... Are we going to, <clears throat> sorry, are we going to post all of the scores publicly for every question? Yes, or or something like this. Uh, ba basically, what I'm going with this is uh, my application was, um, you know, quite serious. Uh, and um, the fact that it scored low implies that either the rubric is incorrect or maybe um, the intent of the allocators is not the same as it was presented to the community. So I basically want to have a public opportunity to get to the bottom of that. Yeah, uh, I think that a multiple people uh, scored yours and there were a number of sections that did not seem to align with the program's current stated goals um, of you know openness, transparency, diligence, uh, real clients with real data doing real onboarding in a real distributed, verifiable way. Um, so if we want to, you know, we can, I'm, I'm not sure how you want to uh, go through it, but yeah, there were yeah, a couple, yeah. there were no, a couple no. sections that if like we could pull it up and compare it directly to the rubric, the stated rubric may not be perfectly accurate, but also the stated rubric is what we are comparing all of them against for now. Um, and so if it's if it's something that you think was not scored correctly against the rubric, we can talk about that. If it's something that you think the rubric is wrong, we can talk about that. But the rubric was pretty similar to rubrics we've used in the past for uh, previous election rounds. And it may change it for the next as we move to rolling applications. Um, yes, the rubric uh, is not perfect and needs to be iterated on. Um, and so this is a question of what are the ways that we need to change both the application itself and the rubric um, in Q2 and Q3. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, this is definitely not the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm not feeling well. Uh, this is not the right forum to have the discussion. I was basically just confirming that there will be a, an answer posted on GitHub 
not just a single number in the air table. And there will be basically a venue which uh, where um, our back and forth is visible to the community. Those are the only two questions I have at this point. I don't know right now if we're going to post the individual scores for every question back or if we will just post the total score. It's, you know, there's an amount of manual lift to prepping and posting every score back. We may do that. Maybe it makes sense to do that for everybody. And then I don't know right now what forum we will have uh, to open it up for all 97 people to potentially come and debate uh, their scores on individual questions. So I am not sure if we are going to open the floor up for that um, and what that would look like. But I, you know, we we can have that conversation. We can take that conversation offline um, and see. I think that there were, you know, we biased towards yes, uh, knowing that we will also be moving to a rolling process. And so people that want to propose alternative systems can see what's working in the community and not. And we can workshop applications more directly before we get to Q2 and Q3. Yeah. yeah. Uh, last, last point. Uh, there were, I believe, only 11 applications that didn't make it. Uh, for applications that were denied, it probably makes sense to publish the entire thing in the, uh, you know, in the interest of transparency. You shouldn't do it for all 97 of them, but for the ones that didn't make it, um, it probably makes sense yeah. to put the, 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 the back end lift GitHub. is the same to do it for 10 verse 90 uh of like breaking out on question eight you got this like because we had multiple people score them so we, we took the averages of multiple scores so to like do the analytics is like it's two additional clicks right to fill down in the air table um if we're already posting a single score back to GitHub, it's no extra effort on that point. So I I see what you're saying. It's like, if we decide to do the work to make every score formatted so that every score gets posted back, we might as well just do that for everybody. Um, but so that's a, that's a open question mark. Um, but yeah, happy to, happy to talk more uh, in another forum. Um, great ones. Yeah, uh, Lucas, I think that's also um, a viable thing. And everyone else's scores are also, or everyone else's replies, sorry, are also public. Um, so other people can also go score them. And, you know, every, everyone is going to bring a different sort of set of biases and perspectives to both scoring themselves and scoring um, somebody else. And it's, it's it is always hard to re fully fully remove your bias. It's also, I think, not a great thing to try and score each individual question totally in a vacuum, right? Because a person may make a claim in a question, but if you look at their aggregate uh, application or if you look at their you know past behavior, those things may inform your overall score. So it's a balancing act. Um, and yes, I think there were uh, 10 or 11 um, teams that were not selected uh, currently for this round. Other questions? I think one thing I would add, Reba, I think you're raising a great point. And I would be curious about this myself. And the question is, hey, I submitted this application. I'm keen to participate in this program. I must be missing something. How can I identify what that missing thing is and make sure that I can update it so I can get this application in. If I'm hearing you correctly, I think that that's a great suggestion and we'll be happy to take action. What I'll do is I'll schedule specific office hours that we could sign up, walk it through. While we have this call, I pulled up your application and I would point to some of the questions that were just very opaque. And I think one of the things that we were looking for in this application was like very specific metrics that the allocator could be held to for diligence, for compliance, for essentially the whole process. And it could be that you just understand it in such like a deep rocked level that, that didn't come through in your application. So I'd be more than happy to like work with you on like question 34, like how do we build out, cool, what's in spade and what are the silly parts 
and then kind of list those. So that way, if it does come back for a compliance audit in 30, 60, 90 days, we can identify like what was those checks done? So to kind of summarize, Reba, it's a great question. I'll set up some office hours, sign up. I'll be happy to walk through that application. And as Galen mentioned, with this rolling application, we can get you cleaned up and set up and then get you back into it as quickly as possible. Cool beans, yeah, we should we, we should do that <clears throat> next week, probably. If there are no other questions or hands, um, like we said, this is uh, this is the set that we're going to go forward with. Watch for comms from us asking for any additional follow-up information. And then between now and the Dev Summit, we'll hopefully be scheduling some onboarding and ratification demos and uh, you know recorded content and getting people plugged into the tooling and answering you know onboarding questions we know that there are going to be a lot there will be questions around you know once i receive this data cap how do i actually send it to people and track it right if you're building an automated system there may be questions around like how do i get an amount of data cap to do testing things like that we've seen those questions come up with um, ways to to run your tooling and test net and run smart contracts in that way so we would like to we want we want to encourage these teams to start building up you know these pathways uh, knowing that they're going to be approved building your client funnel um hopefully these timelines are are communicated clearly and transparently so thanks everybody um and uh happy happy february cheers everyone we'll see you on the next call we'll post this shortly Well, hello, welcome to the second Allocator Governance Call. Today is February 6th. Let's take a look at what we have on the agenda. Same as the first call, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're here with us live, we're gonna talk about a few things and they're all related to the notary scoring and selection for the new allocators that just rolled out. So what we'll start the call with is just a brief review. What was the application period like? How did people apply? Then we'll dive into metrics. What do we see in these applications as a common theme? And then how do we use that to look at like, what are some trends in scoring that would give us the best results for success with new allocators? Then we'll dive into what the actual scores were. So again, we'll walk you through how the process went down, where you could view the scores and any kind of next questions you have. We prepared a brief FAQ with some of the most common questions that have come up. Then we'll talk about what Mata pathways are and opt-in models and Galen will kind of introduce you to this concept. And then we'll end the call with just a brief review of what to expect for onboarding and ratification. If the call is like the morning, we'll have lots of time for discussions. As always, feel free to comment and chat and we'll call it out as we go forward. Or stick a hand up, we'll be happy to pause. So with that friendly check-in, this is the schedule as stands. We're keeping this tentative until we take a vote for the new allocators, but you could probably mark your calendars with near certainty that for the time being, this will be the schedule. We're also mindful of the Chinese New Year kicking off. So there's trying to be not a lot of content announced and pushed out for the next week or so while we're working. So just to give you a heads up, this is the schedule to expect for the next couple of weeks until we get feedback. We're gonna onboard new allocators to the calendar direct. What makes that nice is that they can see it on their personal calendars, helps drive attendance a little bit so you don't always have to follow the shared calendar. We'll get feedback from you and make sure that this is the best time, best content, and really make sure that this program update works. So with that, <laughs> let's talk about why we're here. So as a reminder, the allocator period was open for a few weeks, closed on January 20th. 
And for the last two weeks, the governance team has been going through all of those applications. There was 97 of them. And those of you that took part realize that there is a lot of information in each application. So it was a big, big project. What we did was we looked at each application and we applied a rubric across all of them so that they would have a standard that they could all be compared against and then measured against everyone else. So what's nice is that that rubric has been completed and we have posted the total scores for each notary allocator that will be announced here on this call. So here are the metrics that we saw as we we're going through these data. The first one is if you take a look, there were three different allocator option models. Overwhelmingly in the applications, we saw a consistent return for the manual allocator, the human review in the loop looking, and we saw about 12.5 on both ends for the market-based and automatic. So what this meant was when we were looking at these manual applications, we really pulled out what were the outliers in these that were really good, that had high scores, that had very clear-cut expectations that could be measured, and then looking them from the standpoint of what was a market-based and what was a automatic. From a geographic standpoint, the majority of the content takes place in Singapore, China, and the United States, 64%. And so a lot of the outlying areas are going to be the other countries that funneled into this. So a really mean distribution in these three areas. As far as the question we asked you, when you think about tooling, how will you be doing it? The reason I'm calling this out is we had 72% of our applications that were manual, but you can see the overwhelming majority of those are selecting the software approach. So less human review of an application, less human review of that process and relying on tooling that's getting pushed out right now, like CID checker and a lot of other tooling that you can use to look at this. And then lastly, the data cap requested. This was a good indication of where the allocators saw their business models unfolding and how much data they thought that they would anticipate to bring on the network. If you look at the callouts, the main numbers were 100, 150, and 200. And we use that as the benchmark to compare against other applications. So if someone was asking for 500 or 50, this was a really good way to kind of look at their data cap expectations. Do they have a business model that really meets this threefold increase? So with that, thanks. I'll pause for any questions or post them in chat. Otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to Galen, who will walk us through how the selection is. Thank you. Wait one second. I'm not seeing any hands. Cool. Yes, if you could uh, click forward one, please. Thanks. Um, so we have a, um, uh, we've made our selections. We posted these publicly. Uh, we'll share an Airtable link in a second where you can you can see um, the what we did from from scoring everything against the the public rubric. We pushed it all back. The goal here was to to try to bias towards um, approving and accepting teams that are raising their hand and saying we we want to help support onboarding um, on Filecoin. And so the goal was where are the you know where can where can we try to understand what these allocators are trying to do? Let them understand sort of the extent of the work available to them, um, and bias towards scaling trust over time. So part of FIP three is you know um, give a little bit of trust in some capacity, let people start to engage with the with the technology with the program and see how it goes. So with that in mind, we set this kind of minimum score of one hundred. For this round, you'll see um, everyone's score publicly. Uh, these are currently on this this Airtable form. Our our priority was getting them um, posted and announced to everyone. We'll work this week to get those scores uh, pushed back into each um, GitHub application issue. We're figuring out if it makes sense to just post the average total um, or the average for every question that was scored. We had multiple people scoring them. Um, so that's why it's an average uh, for, for each application. And um, if you click forward one um, for me, please, K Ray, uh, you'll see here there's like a little thing about the meta pathway and a checkbox. Um, we'll, we'll touch on this in a second. So moving to the next slide, please. Posting here this uh, air table should be able to, like I said, see everyone's. This kind of takes you back to takes me back anyway to to high school and college where the teacher would staple up the scores for the exam and everyone just had to go and find their name on the list. Um, there's a little search option at the top right and you can search for your 
application um, based on number or, or name and see approved or not and what the score was and whether we recommend. So like I said, Airtable for now, we'll be making this um, public back into GitHub in the next couple of days. Kicking forward one slide. So a big thing that we've talked about throughout this process is how compliance checks are going to work. We are going to start with an initial approval of data cap. We're then going to work on get, getting these teams connected to the existing tooling and getting them to start working downstream with their clients. And then we will perform these compliance checks. The whole part of this application process was how are you going to behave in this ecosystem to do diligence on your clients? What are your expectations that you are going to hold your clients to? And from there, we will then do a compliance audit against you to see, are you following your stated parameters? So if you said, I will only work with clients that will do a certain type of replica or deal distribution, or I will keep all of my bookkeeping records in a certain place. If you don't meet your own stated parameters, then the, you will not be in compliance as an allocator. So then the governance team will you know, not request additional data cap from the root key holders. So we're going to be looking at all of the distributions from your pathway that you are making downstream to clients and how those clients are behaving on chain with storage providers. Did you perform diligence? Is there evidence of it? Do we need to spot check and find you said you were going to do KYC, KYB and collect uh, you know, business emails? Do you have evidence of that? So these compliance checks are going to start as a combination of you know, more manual while we build more of the automated tooling um, that we can. We have some existing um, tooling in the ecosystem that we're going to leverage to help us make this as fast as possible and as clear and concise. But we will be trusting with an amount of data cap, letting you start to work with clients, letting those clients start to make deals, and then doing these compliance checks. So if you are an allocator that was approved and a client comes to you and says, I would like to work with you, but I'm only going to do you know, one copy. And if you said in your application that you were going to require three plus copies three replicas of your data um, in order to be a fit to your pathway, you need to tell that client they either need to make three copies and work with the distributed set of storage providers, or they are not a fit for your pathway. So the, the expectation, the, the burden of doing this to the standard is on the allocator pathway um, to either approve or deny the clients that you, you work with and to either approve or deny subsequent allocation requests. Um, so. Kicking to the next slide, we have some questions that have already come up a few times. Uh, if you were not selected in this round, there were a handful that either did not apply on time, didn't complete the application process, um, or were not selected. Their application didn't hit that minimum threshold. We used the stated posted rubric. That information was there in advance. Um, that rubric may change some. We want to tweak this process, make it better and faster. Um, same way we may tweak the application itself. But we're going to work towards going in Q2 and Q3 to rolling applications. So our priority now is to onboard the teams that were approved and to then work with us in the, the coming months to uh, figure out where the gaps were, look at what other teams are doing, look at other teams that got approved. Um, like we've said, the scoring, their responses on information, those things are public. You can go check and verify their information and resubmit when we move into that rolling application cycle. There's a question around timeline. When are they going to receive that initial distribution of five pips? We're starting with five for all of these allocators um, because that allows us to, again, scale that trust. Our target timeline right now is the end of February. There's a Phil Dev Summit on um, February 29th happening with ETH Denver. Our goal is to get the distribution of data cap to those teams at that event, to use that event to also have some tooling uh, demos and some ratification sort of onboarding information. Um, there's still a couple extra steps in this process. If you've been here before, you know what this looks like. We've tried to collect as much of this information as possible in advance around sanctions and disclosures. Um, we perform KYC on 
these allocator pathways. So there's a chance that during this ratification, uh, information may be missing or found to be misrepresented or inaccurate, and we will um, not move forward with uh, that application. So next question is around when will three the uh, LDN multisigs um, and other existing notaries, when will they be sunset? Same time as we onboard the new allocators. So when we make the request to the root key holders to issue new data cap to the new uh, approved allocators at, um, addresses, we will also be asking the root key holders to remove any latent data cap from LDNs, uh, from multisigs, from existing allocator addresses, and sort of draw a line in the sand of, of ending those programs, sunsetting uh, those pathways, and moving forward with the um, newly ratified teams. And question four, will the application receive the total data cap requested in question number seven? Initially, no. Um, we asked this question so that we could try and understand a couple of things. How are you, the allocator, thinking about the scale of your pathway? How are you forecasting your traffic? How, you know, how many, what is your existing sort of demand? But it also helps us understand if you make these claims of, you know, we're going to onboard 3,000 PIBs in a month, and then we start issuing data cap, and then there's a lot of lag and latency, and you're not onboarding, you're not working with clients to onboard anything. Um, that is another signal where maybe something is happening and we need to dig deeper into investigate it. But also, we're not going to just take one of these applications and say, the application looks good, here's 100 PIBs, go get started, or here's 3,000 PIBs, go get started. Um, similarly, we will request to the root key holders to start with five. From that five, we'll do these compliance checks. When these compliance checks are completed, we will then request more from the root key holders to top up each allocator. Our target is to do those compliance check audits before they run out of data cap. So if we start with five, the goal is to do that audit when you have um, one PIB remaining to pay based on capacity, speed, all tooling available, we would like to do them sooner. If you've used two and a half out of your five PIBs and all of the work with clients looks good, matches what you claimed, all of the work with your um, that the clients are doing with storage providers looks good, matches what you know you stated in your application, then we would request more data cap from the root key holders. Currently, we're looking at doubling each allocation if all of the compliance checks are good. So if you start with five, double it to 10, double it to 20, and scale it from there. We don't currently have a maximum. This is not a hard-coded um, codified rule. This is something that we're looking at proposing uh, to the community and the root key holders and, and see how it goes. Uh, those are some of the frequently asked questions. Uh, moving down... So the next slide, actually, I see you created ledger. Um, yes, in Slack, we want to have new ledger addresses that have not previously uh, been notaries. This will help with the tooling. This will help with um, all of the different allocation uh, from the root key holders to that address. It will just be cleaner to generate a new um, ledger backed address. So Carrie, can you click forward one, please? Okay. So when we proposed this next election cycle, we sort of talked a lot about these meta pathways um, and wanting to open this up to having more teams design more different types of roads to data cap, right? We, we had an auto verifier in the community. We had some direct allocations where clients would work directly with one notary um, in, a, in a pretty small and laborious way. We had the, the majority of it was running through this one LDN multi-sig with a set of rules that were supposed to be standardized and consistent. And then we had you know, some enterprise proof of concept pathways. We wanted to open this up to have more teams building more of these diverse pathways. And we're seeing that. We're seeing people apply to do um, automated, uh, where they're saying we are building a market matching engine. It's an entire front end. It 
you know, the clients create an account with that front end, they drag and drop their files and we shard them, they connect funds to it. And we have project partners on the back with SPs and we handle the distribution. We're seeing teams build more of these services that are, you know, more um, enclosed and encapsulated. And we want those to have clean and clear pathways to data cap and not need to be kind of shoehorned into some large data set model. So that's why we wanted to build these different meta pathways. What we saw in this round from all of the applicants, um, but also the ones that were accepted, was a lot of teams that have either been in the ecosystem for a while or they're in the ecosystem, but they've been following along and they effectively applied to run what is essentially the same process as the large data set or the enterprise fill process, where it's very similar profiles of clients, very similar profiles of data type, very similar profiles of um, you know, deal making and deal distribution, the ways they would do KYC. So uh, one slide forward, please, K Ray. So what we're doing is we put in here this recommendation. Um, so on some, you'll see here uh, on the Airtable, a checkbox or not, um, that we are recommending as a governance team that these pathways would opt in to this meta pathway. We're figuring out if that means one meta pathway for public open data, which I think it might, and one meta pathway for um, private sort of enterprise data. And the reason for doing this is to group the different allocators that are using sort of a similar set of processes into one group so that the tooling is much easier to onboard. It's much more consistent. It allows these allocators to be uh, much more ready to go out of the box with the tooling that we can build. And it will make the compliance checks much faster and more efficient as we move along. The goal here is that if we have, you know, 30 or 40 different teams that are all doing public open data, they're all doing manual diligence, they're all doing manual KYC, they all have similar sets of distribution, we can tweak the settings for things like, is it two copies or is it five? Is it three regions or is it four? We can, those are easier configuration settings. But getting those people lumped where it's, we're figuring out what the structure is, but potentially it's one GitHub repo where those are different managers in that repo. And it's one set of tooling for these teams that choose to opt into this. It's gonna be similar to the notary registry that exists where um, there'll be a landing page where clients can apply. It'll open this a GitHub issue that'll show up, <clears throat> excuse me, on the registry page. These teams will be able to see the ones that are assigned to them. They could go look at other ones, but it is it is just looking at the ones that are assigned to you for clients that apply to your pathway. Performing the diligence, constructing the messages, sending those messages through your ledger and having them land on chain, having your balance of five PIBs tracked, having all of the bookkeeping consistent. It is going to allow the governance to deem to do a a much faster audit when we need to check compliance. It's going to create a much more efficient and effective UX UI um, for these teams because they will be more up to date with any of the tooling changes. The alternative that that we were looking at was effectively, you know, forking and having every team need to recreate sort of and host their own forked instances of all of these different tools. And some teams may choose to do that. Some teams may not want to participate in this way. We're figuring out the details. There'll be more information coming. This is not a requirement. Um, <clears throat> and again, this I think is not appropriate for certain teams that are explicitly building their own custom tooling. Um, but what we our goal here was, like I've said, to try and make this a better experience for the, the new allocators, a better experience for the dev teams that are building it, a better experience for the compliance teams that need to audit it, and then a cleaner and more consistent experience for the clients who are coming in and applying and may want to apply to multiple allocators and discover all these different allocators. So with that, I covered 
a lot of ground on sort of how we made these selections, uh, some frequently asked questions, and meta pathway, how we're thinking about setting up the tooling. Pausing here to see, not seeing any questions in the chat, not seeing any hands. That's the case. I'm going to kick it back over to K Ray. Hey, Rock. Thanks, Galen. All right. Well, I'm going to put a bow on it and we'll turn it over for discussion. This bow has to do with next steps. These are some of the questions coming through in chat. And this is what the onboarding process looks like for the next couple of days. So, first off, is contact information. And this is essentially diligence on our part. So Jimmy, your question, hey, I've changed my address. Venus, you guys were asking the same thing. This is that cleanup, making sure that your email matches, that your ledger is all set up, that we have all of your contact information to reach you and get in touch. So you should see an email if you haven't seen it from me already. Otherwise, I'll be finishing up everybody who hasn't gotten one and just verifying your organization name matches. And then if not, trying to figure out why and then tie that together. The second part, and we talked about this in the last call, so as a review, we have to have a human name in the country. So it can't be the organization. It has to be Danny O'Brien and a name that we can tie back to. This is for a sanctions and diligence check. If we don't receive it by the time that these go through, then what we'll have to do is icebox your application, put it on hold, get that information from you, and onboard you when the open enrollment starts, probably in late Q2. So please, if you get that email or it's missing, go ahead and put that in. Then lastly, it's all the comms. If you've been a notary before, you realize that there's a private Slack channel, there's regional channels, there's tokens. So all that will be set up. Then we'll walk you through some of the new tooling. So Phil, Simon, a lot of the governance team has been hard at work trying to automate a lot of these and update these systems. So if you haven't been allocating data, we'll just give you a refresh. So we'll have these online, we'll have them recorded, we'll have live chats, we'll have office hours, but the goal is to have everything set up so that way in early March, everyone's taking off. I will note if you look at the last slide, the dates, we're very well aware that the Chinese New Year is coming up. So none of the deadlines should drop within that holiday break. If you have a conflict, I would advise to email us now. Otherwise you'll have until the 29th. So there should be plenty of time. Flag me early if you'll be out. So with that, I'll turn it over to anybody on the call or Galen for discussions or final thoughts. Danny claims to be awake, but I don't buy it. Oh! I bet he's muted though. So yeah, see? yeah, yeah. Ah! So, I know. Not okay. Awake. Okay, I'm gonna. Um, I chatted with you about this before, but I, I'm gonna speak for the the poor the poor ones that um, uh, didn't didn't hit the rubric. Um, and say, so I, I took a look at some of them and, uh, it feels like, um, it feels like they were sort of, uh, they were aiming for something different. Like there were things like, like the KYC, right. And they were trying to come up with systems that didn't have KYC. So they were going, no, no KYC. Um, what do you recommend to, Folks, if you're not changing the Rubik that way, is there? I, I didn't look at the ones that got through. Mm -hmm. So um, for for so people, some who, of the advice that went to people that said we won't do any KYC, right? That went to them before this was this was closed. Those are people that are saying we take paid deals, so therefore we don't do KYC, right? And the 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 confusion here is you are still doing KYC. You are still, you have either you are doing a closed beta or you have people sign up or you mint some trust. To, you're doing something in order to do business with people. Uh, and that is KYC. And maybe it is minimal, but maybe it is just that they give you credit card information. But fundamentally, like if you are offering a service, you are probably doing I, I cannot imagine a way to do this otherwise. You're doing some type of vetting because that also is a way to protect yourself from your service being defrauded, abused, or susceptible to some kind of honeypot attack, right? If, if I was building, if I were building a software service, 
um, that that was a, a you know blockchain staking pool. Uh, I would not want to open that up to anyone without performing some kind of sanctions check or KYC because I can be held legally responsible for the customers that come engage on my platform, right? So the questions are, how are you doing KYC? And some of the responses that we get were, I'm not, or NA, or we don't do KYC. And the reason that's an, an opaque or inaccurate um, response is that it it does not represent what you are doing as a service provider in a professional ecosystem space. So the coaching is, it's not, what are you going to do in addition to just tell us what we want to hear? It's if you're building a service, what is your service? Um, and how will we, the governance team, whoever that is, you know, if, if if, if I get hit by a bus or if we hire a group of contractors that need to go perform a compliance audit, we need to be able to hand them this application that you submitted and say, this person made these claims, go verify that they are doing what they said they would do. So if your claims were, I... I will, I take paid deals. I work with paid clients. So therefore that's how I do KYC and, um, uh, you know, avoid civil attacks. Okay. Well then how are you going to do, where will you hold your bookkeeping and your, your fee structure so that we could audit that there are paid deals. If it's just price recorded on chain, that again, it's like, okay, that, that is like a more consistent, predictable, auditable way for us to take what you state as truth and then go verify it downstream. We can't, I can't, you know, read between the lines on an application and say, well, what I think is being said here, but I th- let me give you the grace to assume what you mean is, because again, I might not be the one doing this compliance check and these need to be public and, and you know, equitable to everyone. So for the teams that were not accepted, there were also a number of people that said we will not do um, we w- we will not do anything to verify or uphold local um, legal regulatory requirements. And again, like we are we are trusted fiduciaries, and we are creating additional trusted fiduciaries. The sort of the reputation of Filecoin as a professional data storage layer is at risk if we say, well, that's fine. You can not enforce the law we are not in a position to be able to approve people that state they will not uphold they will not do anything to to uphold or require that so if the answer is well we have an acceptable use policy and our acceptable use policy has provisions for this and we require our clients to agree to the acceptable use policy that is a stated method that we could then say hey here was an example. Did you enforce this, you know, acceptable, these terms of service? Um, and they can, sh- you know, they could show us what the terms of service are. They could show us back and forth. They could show evidence where their clients accepted them. There's, there's ways that, you know, a team can say, I'm building a platform and I'm going to obfuscate Filecoin away from my clients. My clients, my clients on this platform don't need to know what the governance team is. I'm doing all, I'm brokering this entire service. But what they need to say to us, is they need to explain how they're going to interact and liaise with us. How are you brokering this, you know, middle ground of this two-sided marketplace? Um, and so the thing that we would love to see as we move to um, rolling applications is, you know, if there were 80 other teams that were approved, go look at their applications and and what was approved. And again, maybe the rubric needs to change. There were teams that said we are building an automated notary. We will have we will work with clients that we don't know their identity. Um, we won't verify these other things, but they will collect, they will connect uh, a wallet address. And in doing so, like that is enough KYC information to trust for a small enough amount of data cap. So again, there's there's ways to say, excuse me, um, 
they don't all need to fit the mold. And that's why we had so many questions and, a, and an attempt at making the question so freeform so that people could say, I, the way in which I will choose my clients that protects myself, that protects the network, that protects the subsidy program, this is how I will choose them. This is how I will decide what trust looks like. This is how I will be the social proofing layer. Um, and that social proofing layer can be digitized, obfuscated, automated, connected to a smart contract. And so we were expecting to see more teams put in things like, I will use a staking mechanism. I will not collect any information about my clients, but I will have them stake money into a smart contract. And upon execution of these other parameters, I don't need to know their email. I don't need to know the type of data because I'll handle the backend distribution now I know if they aren't a controlling party, it can't be collusion because I, as the fiduciary, did the data onboarding. And so once the data onboarding is completed, the data got to me, it was sharded it was, and sent to everyone, I'll then release funds from that stake. So that was where we wanted to see, and, we're, and we got a few, and we may see more growth in that region, but that's where teams that are building accurate services, robust service provider you know, niches in this ecosystem. We just need something that is defensible to the whole community, auditable, and transparent. And that's been kind of the, the guiding principles all along. So I think that was super interesting. I think, um, and uh, I mean, we should note that neither of us are, are lawyers, so uh, there may be um, there may be sort of statements in this area that um, that you know you should talk to one should talk to a a, a lawyer about um, the uh, I just said that as a prefix before I'm about to say now um, the uh, it it, it strikes it strikes me that 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 some of the key questions. Um, uh, that that you're trying to draw out is how there can be uh, an objective check of how well these these services are doing, um, and uh, the the I wonder I wonder if it, as a pro, as a result of this um, uh, and sort of drawing out what people are doing for that as you've described, we might come to other alternatives. Like it's a, it sounds like one of the things that we've learned from this process is people have a quite a narrow idea of things like KYC, whereas, and, and I just want you to confirm this, the thing you're primarily looking for is some way that somebody can externally check this system to make sure that it's complying with uh it, it's that these are basically real clients rather than people trying to get data cap uh for themselves yeah so the the scope of the program has been stated the scope of the application has been stated the scope of the rubric has been stated and so like trying to renegotiate like any of those like won't happen here but the scope of the program is real clients with real data doing real distributed onboarding to grow the utility of Filecoin as a data storage network. And so the program is concerned about how do we have these fiduciaries, these, these people that are verifying that those things are true. Right. And so that if you are given this power in the network to make, to make these things true, how are you making determinations that the person you're interacting with is upholding the program scope? And what are your expectations for those people? And how will you make those decisions? So if the form of KYC that you will do is money, we will have stake an amount of money. If the form of KYC that you'll do is social trust, you know, these, these are things that, that, know your client or exist in different business industries to say, I'm engaging in a business practice with someone. I need to understand whether or not I should trust them or whether or not they are a sibyl, they are a bad actor, they're going to 
attempt to defraud me or abuse the power that I have in some way. And in this instance, a way that we see people attempt to, to abuse that power is collusion. Uh, it is it is a closed loop of not a real client. It is not real data. It is not going in a distributed way. It is a single owner operator, you know, attaching data cap to deals that are not legitimate data. They are never retrievable. There is no verification that it was ever real data to begin with, or that they were the data owner, or that it was legal. These are the types of behavior pathways that we are trying to eliminate. And so what are the ways that we can automate that? And what and there, this has been a discussion for over a year of what are the ways to scale this in a Web3 ecosystem? What are the ways to move towards trustlessness or towards permissionless um, systems, knowing that if you are building a market, if you're building a market where there is a, a data owner and a storage provider, if you have this two-sided marketplace and you have the blockchain in between them, there will always need to be some amount of trust for those two people to engage in a transaction, some kind of social reputation, some kind of discovery, some kind of, you know, I'm, I'm putting the money in a smart contract and we need to both trust that the code was written correctly and has been audited you know, at, at all these layers, there is an, there's an amount of trust that needs to happen before before an interaction transaction can take place. But how do we make those things to, to require less social trusting and less risk and less verification and more, you know, trust the code, rules as written, programmatic trust? But fundamentally, the scope of Filecoin Plus has been defined. And the rubric was, and this application process we're meant to try to say, we know that we have a lot of existing players in this ecosystem that believe this is the way to perform diligence, to do business development, to vet clients, to prove that they are good actors. Um, and we have a, we have also been hearing from other teams that they want approval to do it a different way. And so where there's been a mismatch is I, as a, as a single person in this ecosystem, cannot and do not have the, the resources to go say, hey, here's an idea. Um, go build a staking pool and this is what it could look like. And here's the answer. Like, I don't have the ability to say, here's, here's the implementation answer to how to do this. Where I sit is trying to say, we're seeing lots of teams that have a potential solution and they want to try it, or they have a way that they think they could perform this diligence, they could onboard data, they could meet program scope. How do we hold them accountable? How do we give them, how do we ask them questions about what their structure would be? Does that structure seem safe enough to try? Have they thought through it? Can we go and audit it? And if the answer is like, yes, all the way up until the audit, then the question is, well, then what are we missing in doing an audit, right? What are we missing in, in capturing information that we could then go socially prove and programmatically prove? And so using tools like Retrieval Bot is a, is a deterministic metric. It is not the end-all be-all that would prove everything's up to snuff. If 100% if of the data was retrievable, that wouldn't guarantee, therefore, it must all be legitimate data, right? You could still make all of, you can make every CC retrievable, wouldn't prove that it is legitimate or real data. So, so these are, these are different ways to try and say, if a person makes a claim, are there, are their claims substantiated? Um, I don't want to take up, uh, too, too much more time. Uh, the, um, I guess one of the things I'm trying to like eke out is supposing, you know, I have a system that is auditable um, by the Phil Plus team or whoever we decide does the auditing of the allocators, but doesn't, for instance, require KYC or um, some specific thing that we're, that we usually use as a signal to show that, um, uh, that kind of auditing is possible. Uh, what's the what do we think is the best way of kind of workshopping out those slightly those more kind of 
uh, maybe out there solutions or solutions that don't fit in the current kind of uh, process? I would still say that I haven't seen or heard of any of those solutions that wouldn't fit in right. to this like okay. process or rubric category that that all of the teams, you know, last year there was a big push for teams to do market bidding systems. And they said, this will be trustless and permissionless. People will just bid and then there will be downward bidding pressure. And therefore you won't need any KYC. Well, there's still an outstanding question of, well, how do you know who is coming to your platform to enter this bid? You are either going to do this as a closed beta, or you're going to do this where they need to create an account with you. They're going to need to send a message. They're going to need to show some kind of ownership and, and engaging, interacting on your platform. And you as a person, again, you as a person building this bidding engine, if you are holding the data and holding the funds, you are legally responsible in, in almost every jurisdiction for performing some amount of sanctions checks and, and legal verification. Um, otherwise, you are at risk um, and liable for one of those people running illicit uh, content or illicit funds through your system, right? So again, even if you are proposing something like this, you should still be protecting yourself in some way by having some amount of information of who you are working with or some amount of way to scale that trust. They'll only have this amount of power until they've done this many transactions. But to, all of to, those to things, be... hold on, hold on. All of those things are still KYC. If a person comes to you and says, I've registered a, an account, a Filecoin address with you, and I've staked an amount of money into that, and then I have worked with you for X number of transactions, and those transactions I successfully, you know, we do this with SPs. I've successfully made window posts. I've successfully, you know, hit these proofs that demonstrates a willingness and alignment to the system and to like doing those things. That is a form of KYC of gaining trust and reputation over time. And so if a team is able to say, this is how we will protect ourselves and this is our mechanism for KYC. And so the question is like, does this application or this rubric, are the structures of the questions clear enough? Maybe not. And maybe we could like iterate on that. But also from, you know, Conversations that have been happening in Slack, conversations that are happening at um, events and dev summits, conversations that show up in these governance calls. I have not heard a team show up and say, we want to do this. And it's so distant from your expectation or what is available that there's no way to fit an answer in. What instead we're seeing is the answers that they are providing are obtuse, um, inaccurate, and they are not flipping the role that they're in to be able to say, I, I can disclose this amount of information going this way to the program, even though I don't need to disclose all that information to my clients on the downstream. My clients don't need to do create a GitHub account. I'll handle the GitHub account but I'm handling it on behalf of some population. And so the answer is, well, who is that population that you're representing? Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Five minutes. All right. Ship it. Okay, Ray, thank you. All right. Galen, thank you, Danny. Appreciate those questions. And if there is anybody that reaches out to you, Danny, feel free to uh, CC us or whatever we can do to help. Yeah. Right. Engine, Laura, File Drive, Fat Man, Jimmy, SSX, Josh, thanks for coming to the call live. We'll post this to YouTube shortly. Thanks again, everybody.